Psalm 51. I'm going to read from the ESV version of the Bible. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll read a portion of it. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and I and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being or the inward parts, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart and O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me, Lord, the joy of our sal my salvation. I want to talk about under this subject of the fall today, the freedom of repentance. The freedom of repentance. Let's pray. Father, in this brief time that we have together, I thank you for the heart of all these students and workers, Lord God, and I thank you for Jubilee and what you've done it for this, done through it for 40 years. What an amazing ministry uh, where students get to have their journey informed by the gospel so that as they begin to go out in the workforce and the marketplace and to do what you've called them to do in the world, that it's informed by the nutrition of the gospel. And Lord, today, um, before we get and talk about marketplace, we want to talk about their soul's place before you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Um, this psalm, of course, was written uh, by a broken man. Uh, David had been at one time killing it to the glory of God, doing some amazingly dope things for him. And as he was moving forward and pushing forward in his opportunity, he began to become what some would say sort of lax. And so one day David was sort of chilling in his quarters and he got up out of his bed and he put on his crown and cocked it to the front a little bit, put on his robe. And he walks out to the terrace and he begins to overlook Jerusalem. And as he began to look over to Jerusalem, he's just looking at how beautiful um, Jerusalem is. And then over in a way uh, that could only happen usually to a man is out of all of the things he could look at in the city, he saw a little honey dip taking a shower. In a little dime piece, he began to not look at the buildings and their tops and the architecture of the temple. He sort of turned his eyes towards her beauty. And David was like, nah, I ain't going to look no more. I ain't going to look no more. David looked again. He's like, he's like, yo, come here, man. Go grab shorty for me. Bring her to my situation. And, you know. and so many of you know somewhat of the story or a semblance of the story because David got her and had her brought to him by his subjects and God, God being mighty and rich in power, put a good friend in his life and we'll come back to that later. And David later, after God had brought him through his fall, 
<coughs> brought him through his fall beyond what God had created him to do. And he experienced that fall. Uh, when God was bringing him back up, uh, God uh, graced him to write by, uh, uh, the, by, by the uh, inspiration of the Spirit this passage here that we're reading in our hearing today, a powerful passage that I think has helped so many of us who've fallen. If you're under the sound of my voice today and you've never failed before, you're a liar. If you've never messed up really, really bad, you're a liar. If you've never, ever, ever tore something up beyond the, uh, the, 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 the recognizable ability of recognition, you are a liar. But I know that under the sound of my voice, not 99.99% of the people in here, not 98%, not 50%, not 25%, no matter how young, no matter how old you are, you've tore something up really, really bad and you experienced a fall. And so we come here to this passage where this is a passage written uh, to God by David, but really the echo of every broken soul who's ever fallen before to an ode to repentance, which brings me to my first point. If you're going to experience the freedom of repentance in your fall, number one, you got to hunger for the character of God. Hunger for the character of God. Look at the passage. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. <coughs> David throws himself on the mercy of the character of God in this passage. It's interesting, family of God, that he didn't say, Give me your justice. Oh God, <clears throat> give me your wrath, oh God, give me your holiness, oh God. No, he didn't say that. He said, God, pour your mercy out upon your boy, please. See, God's mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. See, y'all looking at me because some of you all think you deserve a whole bunch of stuff. You think you deserve to wake up. You think you deserve to eat. You think you deserve to go to school. You think you deserve to have your tuition paid for. You think you deserve. But, but let me explain something to you. You and I, because of our sin, have no desertion. We have no ability to deserve anything. And so a person that recognizes that and a person that understands that can do nothing but throw themselves on the mercy of a living God. I wish I had about one witness in the building that could testify to the reality that I'm broke, I'm tore up, and God, I know that I'm in need of you. Mercy. But he, but he upgrades it, family. He didn't just say he wanted God's mercy. He said, he, he threw a flagrant word at him. He threw chesed at him. Chesed is a Hebrew word that's untranslatable for us. But we try to, the old King James Version translated it loving kindness. Tried to make it, that's not even a word. <laughs> it's not even a word, like it's a compound word, right? But what's crazy is the ESV translates it steadfast love. Some translations are translated loyal love. It's <clears throat> when you're trying to describe God's commitment to messy people, it's hard to translate. I mean, it's, it's hard to like, it's hard to even describe <coughs> the one who sees our sin, past, present, and future, everything we could have done, actual and potential, the demonic and broken ends that we could have come to, and also see us at our worst point, yet still loves us. Hold on, you missed the shouting moment right there. <laughs> See, see, if, if, if I was at a Pentecostal church conference, all the kids would have been running around the aisle at that point. <laughs> because if you think back to that wild and out that you did, I'm not talking about the TV show, I'm talking about your life. <laughs> if you think about that moment, at your worst moment where you felt the dirtiest, God decided to love you. When Adam and Eve fell, God did not stop loving him because he shooed his love towards them in the fall by what? Going towards them even though he knew they were already messed up. 
God loves to make a move of this covenant loyalty that he's talking about. He said, God, I need, <coughs> I need that, that thing that you got up there in heaven. Like, I need that sense that you still love me. I need that sense that you're still covenantally committed to me. God, I need you. That's what David says here. He says, send me your steadfast. I need mercy. Don't give me what we deserve because I know what I deserve. I deserve death. Because under law, I mean, he had three counts up on him. Three laws. Two, 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 one, 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 two counts of the ability to die by, uh, 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 by, 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 by lethal destruction. Because adultery, he should have died. Killing Uriah, he should have died. And then lying, he should have got beat up real bad. <laughs> so, so David asked God not to give him what he deserved. You ever been in a situation Wait, you, you see, I know y'all don't spank in this generation. We still, I'm a little old school. We, 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 get, we, we get beat downs. I mean, spankings, C, CPS don't. <laughs> but when my son knows, my, my son I just put on the screen, when he knows I'm about to tear him up, <laughs> he, 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 this is his favorite way of turning me towards the gospel. Dad, will you please forgive me? What in the world do you say to that? <coughs> can, can you apply, Lord, I, Daddy, I repent. <laughs> like, dang, how do I even make this a beat down now? You know what I'm saying? <coughs> but I'm saying all of that to say, see my, see my I'm, I'm infantile eternally. But imagine the God of heaven when you say, God, I repent. God, I turn towards you. God, will you please forgive me? Can you give me the loyalty that comes from you that's not deserved, that I know what's deserving of my sin, but God, will you not treat me according to my sin? David goes further. He says, blot out my transgressions. Say, get rid of them. Get rid of those joints, all of them, Lord, every last one of them. Watch me thoroughly. He want a good cleaning. He says, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Next point. Um, if, you, if you're going to experience this whole reality that we're talking about of the freedom of repentance in your fall, uh, the first thing you, you, you saw is what we just said, what we talked about. But next, you have to desire and you have to desire to come fully clean. <laughs> Look at what he says. For I know my transgressions. Stop right there. Hebrew word there for know is yada. Somebody say yada. Yada means to know something intimately. In other words, David says, <coughs> I know how bad I messed up. See, you can't recover from the fall. This is what's beautiful. God disciplines us and challenges us so that, listen, so that we can see the extent of our sin and know it enough to know the effect that it had on us and people around us. That means you can't underestimate the pandemic nature by which your sin impact had on other people. When you underestimate your impact, see, see, you know you're not repentant if you try to push people past what you did to them. You know, you, if you just say, to, well, you know, I know I did it, you know what I'm saying, but get over it, you know what I mean? I mean, forgive me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what, who feels that? Like, like when y'all get married, husbands, try that with a wife. I'm sorry, all right? I, saw, I'm, I said it, there it is. And you're gonna get handed a pillow and some sheets and point it to another room. Because repentance, it, is, it, it involves a level of brokenness and a willingness to not push people. You ever had someone offend you and they're sick of the consequences of their sin that they cause, but they're trying to get you to push past the struggles that you have with the way they offended you? Somebody heard me over here. Somebody heard me over here. See, but the repentant person is patient with the process of people being healed from the pandemic of the impact of their sin on their relationships. And so when David says here, I know my sin, he said, God, I really know how much, how, he, he said, I know I was tripping. Like, 
You got to get to a point in your walk with God. You can't grow if you don't repent. You can't grow unless you look at, you can't be afraid to look at your mess. When people tell you to forget about your past really, really quickly, that's not healthy unless you're dealing with your past. You can't get over your past until you begin to allow the gospel to be applied to your past. And so God helping you to know your sin is not for you to focus on yourself in total depravity so that you can focus and worship the idolatry of your brokenness. That's, that, that's dep- that leads to depression. That leads to self-focus. And it's actually reverse pride. And so, but, but, but when he says, I know my sin, he knows it enough to know that it was a mess and the impact that it had on others and that I am going to gently deal with people and so in those relationships and so with these different people a level of patience so that I can let God work them through the process, not my mouth. And so when he says, I know my sin, he's blown away by what he's done. See, 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 what I like about this is the way he knew his sin also is because he had some good friends. Your boy Nate come up to me, he said, what's up, Dave? He said, what's up, man? He gave him a pound. He said, what's up, man? Yo. He said, yo, I got a story for you. He said, kick. kick. He said, let me know what's good. He, so he started driving. He said, this dude, he had these lambs. This dude had one lamb. He, he, he took this other dude's lamb, and boom, the dude didn't have his lamb no. And David like, get him. Bring, bring money up in here. I'm getting at him. And Nate said, you the man, homie. And guess what David said? I have sinned against the Lord. See, where, where words are plenty, like if you repent with a lot of words, the Bible says in Proverbs, transgression is present. But when you use few words, you know you're repenting. But what I like about that story is he had a friend that wasn't afraid to get in his grill. See, some of y'all don't like people. See, you can't get, to, you can't get beyond fall to redemption and consummation practically in your life. <clears throat> until you have some people in your life that help you focus on the fall so that you won't fall in that area again. You need some people to get up in your face and tell you your breath stink. You need some people to get up in your face to tell you your spirit's ugly at times. You need somebody to get up in your face and tell you because they want better for you and they see better for you. And so don't run off people that's trying to help you because deceitful. Uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of it. Everybody goes, smooches, don't like you. <laughs> What's up, big dog? I see you. I see. Nah, it's about you. Nah, it's you. See, if they always doing that, chuck them to the left. The other left. That's your left. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so knowing your sin is the willingness to deal with it. But then last but not least, we long for... Real transformation. That's the beauty of this. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned. I love this. Because at the center of the gospel is understanding that our sin is ultimately against God, not the people we've hurt. That's the beauty of the gospel. Look what he says. He says, and have done what is evil in your sight. So I've done what's evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words. In other words, you can do to me what you want to. He says, and blameless in your judgment, he says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He said, this goes back to a deeper issue. <clears throat> this doesn't go back to the mere adultery that I committed, Lord. This goes back to my sin nature. Good gospel truth here. He says, behold, and this is where I'll begin to land here. <clears throat> he says, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. I love this. Now, what David is saying to us is truth here isn't merely the right information, like just getting the word of God in you. That's important. But, but, but the idea, the, 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 the nuanced sense of this word is authenticity. Somebody say authenticity. See, see, one of the things that should happen right after the fall is authenticity. When God gives you the ability to be reflective, I like this. David says, you desire authenticity in the deepest places in my life. Oh, God help me. 
You, you, you and I need authenticity. That means realness. We want, and when I talk about realness, I'm not talking about unredemptively. I'm not talking about reality t- TV show real. Like sinful realness that unveils unholiness and put it on display as a way to say someone's authentic. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about authenticity of being honest with your brokenness. Being honest about where you are. And, uh, and, and then allowing, and know, know what he's saying? I want you in the secret places in my life. Uh-oh. Now, what's beautiful about that for David is David says, I don't want a compartmentalized spiritual life. I want a synchronized Christian life. As I close, this is what he means. He, I remember when we, when we got our building in North Philly, we were about, we were about to purchase it, and, and we were buying this 32,000 square foot building that was used for bank, mortuary science, all different types of things. Um, and man, it was, we, I mean, we had rats, bats, and roaches. The trinity of infestation. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, it was crazy. I mean, you open one door, all you hear is just all around. So when we brought the exterminator in, money was like, yo, pastor. I said, what's up? He said, I need y'all to open every door in here. I said, open every door? What you mean? He said, I need you to open everything up so that I can exterminate everything. He says, because if you leave anything closed, when I exterminate these areas, these areas that haven't been cleaned will reinfest the areas that were cleaned. So what is David saying? All David is saying is, God, I open myself up. Help me to open up the skeletons in my closet. Help me to open up the places in my life that I've been afraid to open up for a long time. God, help me to have no area of my life off limits to you. See, that's a gospel transformed life that uses the fall properly. I'm not telling you to go fall, but when you do, use it to open up areas that you never knew you were broken in, areas that you know you've been molested in, areas that you know the devil has gone to work on, and you say, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I want you in every single area of my life. God, I ain't scared no more. I want you to hand walk me through this whole situation and make me brand spanking new. That's my time, and so my prayer is, is as you seek to see God in everything, the thing I hope that you would want to see God in most, because you can go wherever you want in the world and do whatever you want to do, but you are still there. And if you don't let God deal with you, your profession can't cover up the brokenness in your soul. God bless you and take care.